It's not just when things go well from our perspective. You're always good. We thank you, Father, for this time today. We ask that we would uh, have open eyes, that we'd be rightly related to your Holy Spirit, that we might understand your word, that we would uh, understand your word, that we would reflect on it, that we would uh, act on it that we might be those that would be doers of the word and not hearers only, and that in that we would glorify you. We thank you for these things, Father. Amen. Amen. All right. Uh, we continue our study on positional truth in the New Testament. Uh, we we're really emphasizing the fact that it's not just a little truth that Paul mentions a couple times in his apostolic ministry, but it's really something that was a focus of the new teaching of the dispensation of grace. And uh, we saw in 1 Corinthians 4, we've been kind of using this as our main passage for the study. 1 Corinthians 4, we read in verse 15, for though ye have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet have ye not many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I have begotten you through the gospel. Wherefore I beseech you, be ye imitators of me. For this cause have I sent unto you Timotheus, who is my beloved child and faithful in the Lord, who shall bring you into remembrance of my ways which be in Christ, as I teach everywhere in every church. And we would, we've been stating, stating this, oh, Paul is not using hyperbole here, that really it was just something he barely taught, and he's saying here, he taught it everywhere, and he's just using it as a figure of speech, no. He really did teach it everywhere, and it really was his ways. It was his way of living the Christian life in Christ. He lived, he saw himself in Christ, and he related to that, and that was what his part was to live the Christian life. Then it was the Holy Spirit producing, I just, I'm sorry, I got to take this. Hello, it's John Sheet. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> an ad. Yeah, an ad. And a, I said commercial one time with my granddaughters, and they said, no, grandma, it's a pen. Yeah. Yeah. They didn't even know. It's not hilarious. I know. Uh, yeah. uh, today's message is. <laughs> The truck driver. This has been brought to you by FTC of Royal City. <laughs> we were talking about that. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So the truck driver that we waited four hours yesterday for just showed up. Oh. oh. So I just told him, you know, we're going to have to wait at least an hour and maybe till tomorrow because I'll use the forklift if I have to. I can do it. It's no problem. But. Uh, okay, we have a prayer request. <laughs> Anyway, let's continue on with our message. Um, we were introducing, and we mentioned how Paul was teaching this in every church, everywhere. Now, if we turn over to Second Thessalonians, or yeah, was it? Set, yeah, Second Thessalonians is where we were, chapter three, and we we're reading about in verse. Let's go verse twelve. Now them that are such we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. But ye, brethren, be not weary in well-doing. And if any man obey not, oh, I missed my verse. Where is it at? Oh, there it is, verse 11. For we hear that there are some who walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are busybodies. Now, we looked last week at how busybody, when you're a busybody, you're opening yourself up to satanic activities. I mean, that's what it says over there in a, where was it in a, um, where does it tell us that, that it's satanic? 
Um, Acts 19. We went to Acts 19, but that was not the verse. Um, 1 Timothy 5.13. It tells you it's, you're, it's satanic. Into the ways or devices of Satan. Um, so last week we went to, so this is not an explicit statement of positional doctrine, but what we put forth to you last week was that if you're being a busybody, you are not implementing positional truth. That when you put on the armor of God, you do implement positional truth. The armor of God is for standing in a defensive stance against Satan and if you're engaging in the activity that he's tempting you to do, you're not implementing that positional truth that's part of the armor of God. So when you sit, when Paul tells them about busybodies, and there's busybodies among them, there's some among them that were not utilizing positional truth as they should. Okay, everybody with me here? So we went to Ephesians 6. Let's jump back over to Ephesians 6. And we were going through, down through those in a summary fashion. Ephesians 6. And you see in verse 10, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Do we have positional truth in that verse? Yes. yes it explicitly says, says it. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual evil in the heavenlies. In the heavenlies. Where's our position? In the heavenlies. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of the faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the utterances of God praying always with all worship and supplication by the spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Now we stopped last week at salvation. As we said last week, the armor of God is just a mnemonic device. It's to help you remember these truths. You link the mnemonic device to the truth and that helps you go through the truth. And eventually you learn the truth. You have the truth memorized. So you drop the mnemonic device. We have people today. All they know is the mnemonic device, but they don't know the truth <laughs> that relates to the mnemonic device. Right. We want to focus on what these counter thoughts are. Each aspect of these, this armor of God are counter thoughts that are going to help us to keep our mind where it should be in Christ. That's where our minds need to be so we can stand against Satan. Very simply, to summarize the armor of God, it's the supernatural methodology from God that allows us to stand and to keep our minds in Christ when we're attacked by a supernatural foe. That's what it is. That's what, that's what the armor of God is. And as we showed you last week, positional truth is all through this. At first, you'd be empowered in Christ. Then you have truth, which positional truth can be a part of that. Righteousness is positional. We're righteous in Christ. Peace, you can only have peace. You have peace because you're in Christ, but you have, can have peace spiritually by the fruit of the Spirit. So you can keep your mind in a, instead of being all ruffled, have a messy mind, faith, you take the doctrine of the faith to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. Salvation, that's where we're at. 
right? That's where we're at. So there's positional truth in every aspect of these potentially, every aspect of these different counter thoughts. We come to salvation. Now there's three tenses of salvation, past, present, future. Past, we're saved from the penalty of sin. Present, we're saved from the power of sin. The future, we're saved from the indwelling sin principle. At the rapture, we'll no longer have sin in us, right? Now, turn to Galatians 3, 27. Is positional truth related to all these different? 327. Let's actually read from verse um, 25. It says, but after that faith has come, we, talking about transitional Jewish Christians, are no longer under a schoolmaster. For you, transitional Gentile Christians, are all the sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. So they're sons. They weren't sons. And now they're sons. How? Through faith. The word by is a mistranslation. It's the Greek preposition dia. They had to go through the door of faith. Through faith in Christ Jesus. This is initial salvation. And then it explains what that means. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ, you have put on Christ. We've been put into Jesus Christ. That's positional truth. When we got saved, we became sons, and we became sons by being put into Christ. That's what that passage tells us. So initial salvation Positional truth is part of it because you're put into Christ. That's why you're saved. It changes your status. It changes your elevation. It changes the way God sees you. Look with me in 2 Corinthians 3. Let's read together in verse 18. But we all with unveiled face reflecting as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the spirit of the Lord. Okay, this is something going on today. Something going on today. After you're saved. You're being being saved. As a Christian. And so in verse 17, but it says, now the Holy Spirit is that spirit. The Lord is that spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. But we all with unveiled face reflecting as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord. Are changed into the same image from one quality of glory unto another quality of glory, even as by the spirit from the Lord. Now, I look at this, I, I use different verses than I normally use today. Um, I can show you verses that have the word saved in it. Sometimes I get tired of using the same verse. I'm, I, I'm a big believer in proof texting. I like that. Um, but um, sometimes I like to use different verses. Um, this is just a Christian life verse. And God, and, and you have part of this, What are you? What, what's the glory you're being changed to? Yeah, there's a glory that we're going to be, which is... A, our position in Christ, and as we reflect it today, 
we're sh hopefully growing where we're showing uh we're reflecting a little better than la we did when we first got saved and that's changing the more we grow the more we reflect right but we're never going to reflect all that we're going to be because that's our position and that's the rapture the best in christ i am what i will be okay some of that's here in this verse okay now again if somebody wants to fight me over that I'm not going to fight him. That's your problem. <laughs> what I'm going to do is say, hey, you just don't understand this. Because what I'm, what I'm trying to do here is show how some of these theology fits together. Things that you've learned here over years and years and years. You can't teach this everywhere. Because it takes a long time to give the, with the background of some of these verses. But we don't always have to keep hammering the background sometimes we can show you hey these verses let's see how these verses connect yeah. and then we have the future salvation and for there i always like to go there's two passages that i like to go first john three which we've been to many many times in this study First John three, and we read in verse two, beloved, now are we the children of God and it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. And every man that has this hope in him purifies himself, even as he is pure. So that looks at the future salvation impacting our present salvation, right? And it's looking at the rapture. And as we've already established, the event at the rapture is who we are in Christ is what we're going to be at the rapture. See? And so it relates. It relates to this doctrine of positional truth. Turn to 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15. And we'll read from verse 49. And as we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, we're in verse 52, in the twinkling of an eye, by the last trumpet, for a trumpet shall trumpet, and the dead shall be raised, incorruptible, and we shall be changed for this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality we will no longer be subject to death we will no longer be subject to corruption we will no longer become less than what we are right the minute you have new life it's dying what a oxymoron, right? I always, that's something I like about my dad. When uh, you, when you talk to him, he always just says, just how you doing? Just barely. He always just trying to work that in just barely. A lot of people don't know what he means, but the rapture could happen at any moment. A lot of people think, well, he's about to die. That's why he's saying just barely. He looks at that old cripple is about to die. No, he's saying that because he's looking forward to Christ. He's looking forward to that new body. You know, he's looking, and I think he's kind of excited about the potential. I don't know if he really believes it, but I think he's really excited about the potential that you'd have no scars. He's always asking. Now, Christ still had scars. He's always asking that. No, Dad, you're not going to have scars. That was to show for a purpose. That was for a purpose. That was to show that he had died and resurrected, that he really did die for our sins. He was put on a cross as it was prophesied. Your accident was not prophesied. <laughs> it might have been in a book, but we don't know about it. Um, so anyway. Future salvation. And it does relate to positional truth because the rapture is 
In Christ, I am what I will be. Now, and then you have the word of God. Turn back to Ephesians 6. Ephesians 6. Now here in verse 17, and the sword of the spirit, which is the utterances, the little rhema, the little rhema. It's not the lagos here. It's the rhema. These are the little utterances. Okay. He's not talking about all of the Bible here. He's talking about the specific utterances to, that relate to whatever you're being tempted with. Now, if you're being tempted to be a busybody, there's all kinds of verses that say, hey, mind your own business. Mind your own affairs. It might be those verses that are brought to remembrance. It might be, hey, you need to be getting your mind on things above in Christ. You know? Um, Paul taught about his ways, which were in Christ. And you're thinking, my ways aren't in Christ right now. I'm busy in everybody else's ways. I'm in Susan's ways and Dwight's ways. I'm, I'm, I'm all in their business instead of minding my own business. I'm not looking at who they are in Christ. I'm trying to figure out who they are down here so that I can be in their business. I don't know. I don't know what that's all about. Or maybe you think about the fact, maybe the spirit brings the verse into remembrance. It says, we were created in Christ unto good works. And to good works. Instead of being in other people's business and causing trouble, maybe you should be focused on what these good works are that God created you unto. But the only way you're going to recognize those works is if you have your mind on things above so the Spirit of God can empower you and have you ready to do them with a good attitude. Right? Yeah. Now, with that said, I want to emphasize something today, along with looking at this busybody and the armor of God. I want to emphasize how Satan, one of the big things Satan is against is Christians getting their mind on things above, and then Christians keeping their mind on things above. He's, this is directly opposed to what he's trying to accomplish by interfering in Christians' lives. Okay. And I'm just thinking about how we want to attack this. Let's look and start by looking at 2 Corinthians 2.11. And where is 2 Corinthians 2.11? It is in 2 Corinthians, or 1 Corinthians 2.11, not 2. No, 2 Corinthians is where I wanted. 2 Corinthians 2.11. This is the same people. He's writing to the same people that he wrote about my ways, which be in Christ, right? Remember, who were the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians? Who were they trying to follow after? Apollos. And they were trying to follow after. Some were following after Paul. Some were following after Peter. Was it Peter? Yep, Cephas. Right. Look here in 2 Corinthians 2, and we read in verse 10, it says, To whom ye forgive anything, or literally be gracious towards, I forgave anything. To whom I forgave it. For your sakes forgave I it in the person of Christ. We're in the presence of Christ. Lest Satan should get an advantage of us. For we are not ignorant of his designs. And the words designs is the result of the workings of the mind. The result of the workings of the experiential mind. We experientially know what Satan can do and what it results in. So we're going to deal graciously with, with others 
Because if we don't deal graciously with others, Satan gets a foothold where he can begin to do his thing, right? Let's turn to 2 Corinthians 11. Jim was in this passage this morning. 2 Corinthians 11. And let's read together. Now, again, we're not going to take all the time to develop this in 2 Corinthians, but who is Paul dealing with here? Paul is the apostle to the dispensation of grace. Corinth is following men in the first book. And you get into this, they're still being susceptible to false apostles. I think they've moved on from Peter, Apollos, and Paul at this point. Now they're following just these men, completely satanically empowered men. Okay. And Paul is highly concerned. So you come here to chapter 11. Would to God you could bear with me a little in my foolishness. And literally his unreflected, un, having no frame of mind, okay? <laughs> and indeed, bear with me. For I am jealous over you with a godly zeal. For I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve... Through his subtlety, so your noemata, same word, it's the experiential mind, the results of the experiential mind, should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. So you have deception here from that's similar to the deception that the serpent used to deceive Eve. And then you being corrupted in your experiential mind. Okay. And Paul says, this has no, I'm, this is foolishness that I'm talking without a frame of mind. Now, just all of that is alluding to where should you have your mind framed? In Christ, right? And he talks about the simplicity that is the simplicity and the purity, the one on account of Christ. I, it's ice Christon. So it's not explicitly in Christ, but it's on account of Christ. And I think it is talking about the way of life that we have in Christ. Okay. Now, with that said, This is alluding to this idea that Satan is directly opposed to Christians living in Christ. He's, he's opposed to you thinking on things above, and you're, he's opposed to you then keeping your minds on things above. Why? Because he is opposed to God. He's opposed to you reflecting Christ. Let me show you some examples of key positional truth passages that are mistranslated in the King James Version. The King James Version is the, you know, recently we have a lot of versions that are good, right? But from 1611 to fairly recently, it was the English version that most of the world had. And yet you go to key positional truth passages and it's mistranslated. Okay, let me show you some examples. Turn to Romans 6. Who's in charge of uh, translating the King James Version? There's some 60 guys that were in charge of translating the King James Version. from, And they only had, I believe, they had the Textus Receptus, probably about 27 Greek texts. That's a very small representation. 
there's a book about the, about the translators. I don't have it. I was just told about it. And I'm repeating what I was told about it to you. Of the 60 or 70 translators, go ahead. Say it was 70. It was like 66 of them were Armenian in their theology. Four of them were not Armenian or literal, more literal based translators. Okay. So that tells you, even though the King James is a relatively decent translation, you see a lot of places where you can see this area of theology was more emphasized in the translation than this other area of theology. Okay. And who's in charge of the religious world system? Satan. Satan is in charge of it. So I don't care what translation you have. You got to have people that go back to the original and you have to, there's going to be, even if you know, some have somebody that goes back to the original, they're not infallible. They're not infallible and they're not inerrant. And you have to be willing. What does it say? We got to go back to it. So Romans six, look here in your King James, it says, likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God. And it says through Jesus Christ, our Lord. It could be argued this is one of the most important positional truth passages. It's not through Jesus Christ. We're, we're alive in Jesus Christ, our Lord. We're alive in Jesus. There's no reason to translate this through. It's the preposition and. There is a preposition that you would translate through, and it's not here. There's no reason for this. No reason. Yet it's hidden. Positional truth is hidden on a key passage that gives you freedom from your sin nature. Was that verse 8? That was verse 11. Okay. Okay. Turn with me over to 1 Corinthians 4. Or 1 Corinthians 1. First Corinthians 1. And you can see this one in verse... Three and four. It says, Grace is unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given you, not by, but in Jesus Christ. You've been given grace in Jesus Christ, that in everything ye are enriched in him by all utterance and by all knowledge. Okay. So again, it's hidden. This idea, what you've been, you've been given grace in Jesus Christ. It's because we're in Christ that we're graced. Ephesians 1, 6. Now it's hidden there too. Because the word grace is, instead of just saying you were making it a verb and saying you were graced in Christ, what do they say? Accepted in the beloved. So you have this idea of grace is hidden there in the King James Version. Look in Galatians 3.14, another key positional truth passage. Now, it's easy to just correct these as you go through. But what I'm emphasizing here is this is satanic perversion in the translation. And it was, it was, I think it's on purpose. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> uh, Galatians 3, not Ephesians 3. Galatians 3. And I'm looking for verse 14. That the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles, not through Jesus Christ, but in Jesus Christ. It's in Jesus Christ that there is neither Jew nor Gentile, but we're all one body, right? It goes on. Look in verse 26. Again, for ye are all the sons of God, not by faith. This is a this isn't this is telling you how you get to be in Christ Jesus. It's through faith, not. By faith. So the, here it should be through. 
telling you how you get to be in Christ. But they translate it by. When it should be in, they translate it through. When it should be through, they translate it by. You see how confusing? They, they got you all confused. And then, of course, Ephesians 1, 6 that we already referred to. You can turn there. Ephesians 1, 6. To the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath not made us accepted, but he has graced us in the beloved. But he's graced us in the beloved. So they've kind of left this kind of a, they've turned it into a, I'll tell you how most people take this. It's just, it's just a big blob. It's just, it just doesn't, it's ambiguous. But when you translate it grace, you know exactly where you're getting your grace. It's not through sacraments. It's not through uh, going to church. It's not through any of the, it's through being in Christ. It's through being placed in Christ by the Holy Spirit through baptism. It becomes really clear. You have clarity as to how you have the favor of God. Or actually merit that he gives you. All right. It's through being in Christ. Now, if you turn back to 2 Corinthians eleven thirteen, I want to emphasize kind of really emphasize this wasn't the purpose of Jim's message this morning. So he didn't do it because it wasn't the purpose of his message. But this is kind of the purpose of what we're doing. So we're going to kind of drill down on this a little bit. When it talks about preaching this other of a different kind, another of the same kind of Jesus, and it's the Jesus of the Gospels, it kind of brings a real highlight to what it means to teach the Jesus of the New Testament, the Jesus Christ of the New Testament. Now, he was emphasizing how the name Jesus and the name Christ is important, but notice how Christ and Jesus are separated in this passage. And Jim was also talking about how sometimes when you divide chapters, it messes us up because we lose a good truth that's in the previous chapter. Here we have it in two verses. If you separate verse three from verse four, you can miss the Christ that's connected to the Jesus. <laughs> and so you have the simplicity that is in Christ in verse three. And then you have Jesus in verse four. See, Notice in a lot of popular Christian songs, and I'm not saying we should stop singing these songs, they always talk about Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And they don't talk about Christ, Christ, Christ. I don't know if it has to do with, you know, Christ just doesn't rhyme well. I don't know. Or, but usually when they say Jesus, 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 they're just talking about the Jesus of the Gospels. I mean, he healed everybody. Isn't that wonderful? He fed everybody. Isn't that wonderful? Right. I love to be healed. I love to be eat, but I have to work for my food today and I have aches and pains. Come Jesus. Is that the extent of what we're supposed to be thinking about? No. If, if that's all there is to the Christian life, then I'm coming up really short. Okay, so here, what I'd like to do is, if you just emphasize the Jesus of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, what don't you have? What don't you have? What, what is the new identity of Christ that brings us new realities? Because... We're Christians. What are you missing out on if you focus only on the Jesus of Matthew, Mark, and Luke? Let's start making a list. I'm not going to re really put you out there. To oh, I'm going to just give them to you, okay? This is grace. <laughs> I'm not going to make you work. I'm not going to make you work. I'm talking too fast. Okay, first of all, <coughs> Christ means glorified resurrected one 
we can't be glorified in Christ if he's not glorified and resurrected. Okay. So you don't have that. You're not, if you're only emphasizing Jesus of the gospels, you're not going to be thinking about the fact that you're already glorified in Christ. So what are they going to do? They're going to make you work in, you work your butt off so you can be glorified in Christ. Okay. That's what happens when you teach the Jesus of the gospels. Because you're not going to be emphasizing the fact you're already glorified. Romans 8. Okay. Next positional truth. You're not going to have it. You're not going to emphasize positional truth. You're going to talk about how Jesus did this and the Beatitudes and, you know, bless those that are meek, bless those that are weak, bless, 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 bless be, bless be, bless be. Matthew 5. Positional truth is in the New Testament. Starts in John 13 and goes through the New Testament. And you only have positional truth is Christ is buried, rose again, and sends the Holy Spirit to put you into Christ. That's all New Testament. It's not the Gospels. The faith. You don't have the faith. The doctrine of how to be spiritual and have victory over your spiritual enemies. You don't have it. So you're living a defeated life. Here's a big one. Gospel of salvation. For the New Testament. You don't have it if you just focus on the Gospels. You don't have it. Thus, no one's saved. Okay. Boy, this is getting pretty depressing, isn't it? <laughs> when we're done, I hope you think it's important to focus on Jesus Christ, not just Jesus of the Gospels. No indwelling Christ. And what do you get because Christ indwells? Eternal life. So there's no eternal life. Right? Because Christ had to go so he could send the spirit to put Christ in you. So if you only focus on the gospels, you're not going to know this. Here's one. No preparing a place. Remember John 14, three, Christ is going to, I, I, I got to go. So I can go and prepare a place for you. If you only focus on the Jesus of the gospels, What's Christ doing today? Right? He's doing something today. He's preparing a place for you and me. And he's going to come and get us to take us back to where he is. No rapture. Boy. Whew. Those are fighting words right there. If that's precious to you, those are fighting words. The rapture is important. That's our hope. That's our happy hope. If you don't have the rapture, you're sad. You're a sad Christian, and I'm sad for you. And if there's no rapture, no resurrection. Resurrection for Christians happens at the, rap at the rapture. Let's keep going. You thought I was done because I ran out of space. <laughs> but I got more things than what will fit here. No high priest. He rose on high and he became our high priest. You have no, what, what does he do as our high priest? He intercedes for us. He has, because he suffered like we suffer, right? We can go to him. We can go through him to the Father. All these different things. No forgiveness. Where are we forgiven? In Christ. So if you just focus on the, there's no forgiveness. No maturity. No growth, no maturity. The whole believer priesthood. No believer priesthood. 
And you notice that. You look at these people that, that only focus on the Gospels. They don't understand the sacrifices of a believer priest. What is all that? It's all kind of, eh. Why are you getting into that? What are you talking about? That's precious truth. Precious truth. Sacrifices that we can do because we're priests. We're priests. We can do works on the benefit of other for the benefit of others. Spiritual gifts. Nobody will understand this. These notes. It's color coded. You have to follow the colors. <laughs> Spiritual gifts. Spiritual gifts are a New Testament truth. And it has to do with the new identity of Christ. You're placed into Christ exactly where the Holy Spirit determines. And your place in the body of Christ is your function. See? So that idea, that's part of Christ's identity, his new identity as the glorified resurrected one. And if you only teach the Jesus the Gospels, you don't have that. Grace. Remember the uh, Gospel of John? How does it say it? Uh, Moses, law, but through Jesus Christ came to be grace and truth. Right? Truth existed and grace existed before, but the grace and the truth came through Jesus Christ. So the grace that we know today is through Christ's new identity as the glorified resurrected one. Because the, the, the corpus of merit that we have is because we're in Christ. Hope. The hope that we have today, we don't have. We don't have it if you just focus on the Gospels. Our promises are completely different. We are a heavenly people. Yeah. Fruit from the Spirit. Yeah, fruit from the Spirit. You can go on and on. You know. Yeah, just keep, yeah, just keep going. But you can see how these things relate. So much of it goes through who we are in Christ. And that's his new identity, identity having in his humanity, raised from the dead, and sat at the Father's right hand. So in his humanity, we are in the glorified, resurrected humanity of Christ. And when he was on earth, that was not who he was. See? That was a very momentous moment when the Father said, sit, I have given you occasion. I have given today. I have begotten you. He's I, today. I have given you occasion. Sit at my right hand. And at that moment, he sat and he established, he created in himself one new man. Okay. Where we could also have a new identity. Okay. And you don't get that in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And if that's all you focus on, you're going to be teaching a different kind of a similar Jesus because it was Jesus, but it's not the Jesus of, that we relate to. All right. Now, just a little aside, fitting into what we're looking at. We got a few minutes yet to finish. That all came together so nice. I'm so happy when the information I've put together <laughs> comes together and I'm not like running out of time. Not that we can't come back next week. But now let's look at 2 Peter 5. 1 Peter 5, thank you. You mean what I know. You say what I not nah, whatever. <laughs> We certainly don't have that mind control of the spirit that the apostles sometimes exhibited. 
So 1 Peter 5, read with me. In verse 5, it says, likewise, younger, talking about elders, younger elders, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. Who was the first one to be affected by pride? Satan. Lucifer. Yeah. Lucifer was the first. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God. Humble yourselves under the, what's the mighty hand of God? His omnipotence, right? Humble yourselves under the power of God that he may exalt you in due time. That he might lift you up. So we're all in his hand. Right? You know, you don't stand on your own power. Verse 7, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walks about seeking certain ones to devour whom resist steadfast by the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. Now, the reason I came here, because I just wanted to use this verse as a, because we were talking about Satan, because we were talking about the armor of God, we were talking about how positional truth is part of potentially all aspects of the, the armor. Okay. We saw how Satan, we talked about how Satan doesn't want Christians to set their mind to things above evidenced by bad translations and he's in control of bad translations right he has the ability to influence men of the world sons of satan to mislead christians does satan have that ability yes he does we talked about how he has devices and he wants to affect the results of your experiential mind. So you always you so that you come out with wrong conclusions and then you act on them, and then you're not living in Christ, exhibiting the fruit, exhibiting the life of God. He wants to mess that up. We talked about how putting on the armor of God is a supernatural methodology to keep your mind on things above. So that you could withstand a supernatural attack and continue to express eternal life. To continue to reflect the life of God. Right? We talked about those things. But it says here, Satan goes about like a roaring lion, like a roaring lion seeking not whomever he may devour, but certain ones. Why does it, in your English, it says whomever. Whomever has a, a, an element of uncertainty, but it isn't uncertain. It's certain ones. He's looking for certain ones. Certain ones. Okay. When, now, this fits very well in with the analogy of a lion. When a lion goes out on the savanna, does he just go for any random beast out there on the, any random gazelle? How does he pick his prey? He looks for the weak. He looks for the unalert. He would like the one that's the perfect specimen, that's lots, right? But that's going to have to be optimal situation, right? Maybe it's noisy and he can sneak up on him easier. But most likely he's going to go for the weak or the young, right? Because the lion just doesn't run, can't run as long and as fast as the, the gazelle or whatever that is. In a similar way, Satan is looking for certain ones. I'm not saying these certain ones are weak or the old. 
I'm saying certain ones, optimal situation. Okay, optimal situation. And let me put forth to you here in the context, it's ones that are worried with the cares of this world. What does that mean to be worried with the cares of this world? It means you're not utilizing your spiritual sight and you're instead looking at the circumstances of this life and letting it mess up your mind so that you're not thinking on who you are in Christ, who you are in Christ. Okay. And now I'm going to take you to a passage that kind of proves it. Philippians 4, 6. says in verse six, be careful or stop being anxious or don't be anxious about one thing, but in all things by worship and by supplication with thanksgivings or after thanksgivings, the, let your requests be made known to God. That all sounds pretty straightforward, right? Communicate to God. Stop trying to worry about everything, how you're going to solve the problem, how you're, what are you going to do? What are you going to do with this? What are you going to do with that? What are you going to do? Give it to God. And you give it to God in this way, by communicating with him. And he tells you four different ways to communicate with him. But this is a promise. What does it take to claim a promise? Faith, part of the fruit of the spirit. You have to have your mind on things above to implement this. Because faith comes when you're setting your mind on things above. The spirit produces his fruit. Faith is a part of that fruit, which is the ability to believe. It's the ability to act on a promise of God. And it tells you here what happens. And the peace of God, which covers over, has a protective covering over all the mind. But guess what the word mind is here? Noon. Okay, the experiential mind. Now, it's a, the other word that, what does Satan, the noema, the experience, the results of the mind. So you want to have, this is interesting, Right? This is prior to satanic attack. This is just when circumstances are, are getting you all in a Twitter. Satan's looking for that person that's all caught up in worry and concerns, not using faith. So the peace from God, which covers over all the mind, shall guard your hearts and thoughts. And then you have, that's actually Noema Ta. Where? In Christ Jesus. <laughs> I, I think that's so neat how this all comes together. There's a methodology to keep your mind on things above prior to satanic attack. And then if you still fall into satanic attack after that, or in spite of that, there's an armor of God to get your mind back where, to keep your mind where it should be. Pretty awesome. Pretty awesome. And I'm going to tell you something. Let's say there's a war. I'm not too concerned about some foreign power attacking royal city in the big scheme of things we're relatively insignificant now you might say they might hit hanford they might hit the grand coulee dam okay and if somebody might on a way out there say they might hit the royal slope because of food supply i don't i doubt it i doubt it 
pretty insignificant. I would be really confused if somebody was hitting Royal City, a foreign power. People hit the things. They're going to be the quickest way to put the adversary down. So the most powerful being that God ever created, Satan, with his minions that followed him, are coming after us, not because of who we are, but he doesn't want us to live in Christ and have our thinking on things in Christ, because then God accomplishes something through us. So he taxes something that is crucial for all that to happen. Everybody see that? Positional, this again just emphasizes how important positional truth is in the Christian life. Satan is against it. He's opposed to it. He attacks it. He doesn't want you living in Christ. He doesn't want you setting your mind to things in Christ. He, if you are, he wants you to stop it. And he will has whole methodologies to hinder you. That's it. Let's close with a word prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you are faithful. And that even though we have a supernatural being that is opposed to what you're doing through us, that you are greater than the world and you are greater than Satan. And you've given us everything we need for life and godliness. We just thank you, Father, for who you are and for the fact that we are so privileged that you are involved in our lives. Amen.